class is time to, you know, it's time for class to begin. Let me see here. Uh, Rose. Mm -hmm. Lanny. Mm -hmm. Shelby. Mm -hmm. Bryn. Mm -hmm. Bueller. 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 Hmm. Joe. Hmm. Patrick. Hmm. Polly. Polygenic. Polygenic. Where is Polygenic? Here I am, Miss Meosis. I'm ready to learn biology. Are you ready to learn biology? How about you teach me really fast? There sure are a lot of students absent today. Well, I guess the class must go on. Well, maybe I just should have skipped with the rest of them. Ugh, Polly. All right, Polly, first things first. We need to know some basics about biology, especially in the lab. One of the most common tools in a biology lab is the microscope. But don't get me wrong, it's a very complex and expensive machine. Yeah, I used one of those in high school. You should always put the cord away and be sure to store it at its lowest level. Very good. So, how do we store a microscope properly? Is this in this picture of a microscope, is it stored correctly? No, not like that. I just said you have to put the cord away and store it at its lowest level. And don't forget to carry it by its bottom. Very good. Now, what other tools did you use in high school, Polly? Well, I learned how to use a pipette and a hot plate. For the hot plate, all you have to do is adjust the left knob until it gets however hot you want it to get. And for the pipette, it takes a little more skill. We learned how to use the meniscus to measure the liquid and we had to be very precise when using a pipette. You certainly do know your basics so well. So, let's go ahead and move along. Have you ever heard of a centrifuge? No, what's that? Well, it's a rather simple concept to understand. The centrifuge is um, designed to spin at a very high velocities to separate the different layers of a substance. The heaviest layer goes to the bottom and then the lightest layer goes to the top. This semester we will use this technique in several labs including our photosynthesis lab. I heard they used to use that for women who were in labor too long and they spun them around until the baby popped out. Okay, back to the point. To work the centrifuge, you place all of your test tubes on equal weights into opposite slots. If the centrifuge is unbalanced, it will not spin properly. The next step is to secure the lid, close the machine, and then set the dials. The left dial is for the time. For example, how long you want the centrifuge to run, and the right dial will adjust the RPMs, rotation per minute. Okay, the centrifuge seems simple enough, but what else can I learn how to use properly in the lab? That's a great question. All right, the next thing I'm going to explain to you is the vernier conductivity probe. We will use the conductivity probe to measure the diffusion of ions through a membrane. Now let's go to the lab and you can learn this process hands-on. So, the lab procedure says to first measure out 10 milliliters of saline solution. I can use my pipette skills to do that. Then, it says to squirt the liquid into this permeable membrane and place it in a beaker filled with water. Next, enter the vernier conductivity probe into the water and turn on the magnetic stirrer. Make sure the vernier conductivity probe is connected to the computer and ready to collect data. Now the probe is measuring the conductivity of the saline solution. 
This experiment produces the best results when the probe is equal distance from the saline solution in each trial. Here is what the computer will look like as it is collecting data. Finally, press collect on the computer and watch the data come up on the screen. Very good, Polly. You take directions very well. Now, let's move on to our oxygen gas sensor. This tool is one that sends information to the computer similar to the Vineyard Conductivity Pro. The oxygen gas sensor, though, is used to measure the oxygen concentration um, in the air. As you can see in this video, the scientist, aka me, poured the solution into the container and then firmly pushed it onto the oxygen gas sensor. Now, after this, we're going to click on, on the computer and watch the data show up on the computer screen. This is what your results should look like after you've collected your data. So, Polygenic, now you said you know how to, micro, how to pipette, but have you ever micro-pipetted? Um, I think so. Is that the thing that uses itty bitty increments? Like, she wore an itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow Stop! Bitty, Stop! Stop! Bikini. No. Yes, I mean, ugh. It measures tiny increments, yes, but not itsy bitsy bikinis. The first thing you have to do to use a micro pipette is to set it in increments of, I guess, microliters by unlocking the thing on the top and turning the knob. As you can see in the video, the scientist, aka Miss Meosis, is setting the correct amount of increments on the micro pipette. Now, she is collecting the exact amount of dyed DNA and releasing it into the gel. She is very, very carefully careful not to spill any of the DNA out of the well. This is a technique that takes a lot of practice. Do not attempt this at home. This technique is used in many professions, especially the medical field. DNA fingerprinting has become invaluable in labs across the world. Well, that is how to use the tool, but that's not all there is to it. There are thousands of reasons to use a micro pipette. So, you need to be sure your technique is perfect for using this tool. No problem. That's what I like to hear. All right then. Now, let's talk about electrophoresis. This is the last piece of equipment we will talk about today. I think you've had enough of it to think about tonight. God knows that brain's full of hers. Huh. OMG! You mean I have to remember all this? Yes, electrophoresis is a positively and negatively charged box that moves charged particles in the op to the opposite side. For example, a negatively charged particle will move to the positive side and a positive charged particle will move to the negative side. We will use electrophoresis to separate DNA particles. This technique is used in CSI, CIS, sorry, CSI labs. CSI, yes, we all know CSI. To match DNA of a suspect with the sample of DNA from the crime lab. Isn't that right, Fred? Right, Fred? Oh, he's so cute, isn't he, guys? So we get to play CSI? Who are you? Who, 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 who? Um, well, sort of. But our procedure is just an example, not a real case. How we begin the electrophoresis process is by pouring our buffer into a box so a thin layer will cover the gel. After we pipette the samples of DNA into the wells, we can put the lid on the electrophoresis. Now we make sure to plug the black cord into the black outlet and the red cord into the red outlet. To set the gauge, you have to turn on the electrophoresis and then adjust the voltage. In this video, we want 100 volts. Next, we can set the time by switching the mode to time and setting it for 30 minutes. After you have finished the electrophoresis process, you will stain your gel. In 24 hours, your result should look something like this. We will then compare how the DNA has moved in the wells. no way I'm going to remember all this information. Well, then why don't we just have a review right now? Um, is it extra credit? No. 
then I don't want a review. Fine, it can be extra credit. Okay, let's get started. <sighs> okay, what is a magnetic stir and what piece of equipment is used to do this? Um, that's the thing that stirs the, the substance in the beaker on the hot plate. Um, it was invented by Arthur Rossinger on June 6, 1944. What? Oh, yes! Wow, you really know your stuff! So, next question. Why should you never lay a filled micropipette on its side? Um, oh, okay, because the liquid could flow back into the miston mechanism, you should always never turn the volume adjuster past its maximum range. The ones we used in high school were P10, so they couldn't be turned past 10 microliters. That is correct. Don't forget the test tomorrow. All right, Christy. Shit. <laughs> it's on the top. You know, I guess we could always show our last collect sign. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in high school, Polly. Well, I learned how to use a pipette and a hot plate. For the hot plate... <laughs> for the hot plate, all you have to do is turn it on. Well, maybe I just should have skipped with the rest of them. Uh, Polly. Should we stop there? Because <laughs> then I'll have to come back up here. Because then I don't know what to bet. I hope you enjoyed our production, and we'll and see you next time with... Damn, my tents are good! <laughs> we can crop them. There were no animals harmed in the making of this film. <laughs> Damn! <laughs> if you enjoyed this production by Christy Hooper and Heather Cullen, which we know you did, please feel free to recommend us to any public media production companies you want. What is he doing? No animals harmed in the making of this video. Fred was already dead by the time I got there. And if you enjoyed this production by Christy Hooper and Heather Cullen, which I know you did, please feel free to recommend us to any major media productions. We, we hope, hope you enjoyed our production, production and we'll see you next time in Mrs. Meosis' classroom, second semester. semester.